Hi, my name is James, and in this video I'm going to be going over Kepler's first law, second law, and third law. And we're also going to be deriving Kepler's third law, because it's something you need to be able to do from most physics exam boards. And when I do that, I'm also going to be go uh, just sort of briefly explaining the formula for centripetal acceleration, uh, just because it's involved in the derivation, so I thought it would be useful uh, to just throw it in there, just to make things a bit clearer for anyone who's a bit confused uh, by this topic. So uh, the first law is that uh, a planet moves in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one of the foci, and foci just means the plural of a focus. So essentially all orbits are ellipses, even a perfect circle is technically an ellipse, uh, so any that's not a perfect circle is going to have two foci. And Kepler said that uh, a planet's orbit, which is an ellipse, the star it's orbiting, the sun it's orbiting, is going to be at one of its foci. And that's all you need to know for his first law. And then his second law, uh, which uh, is a bit more sort of wordy, uh, is that a line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out an equal area in an equal period of time at any position in its orbit. Uh, so essentially, if we have uh, our planet very close to the sun in its orbit, it's going to be uh, orbiting very, uh, at a much higher velocity. Uh, so although it's moving very fast, the line joining the sun and planet, because they're not very far away, isn't sweeping out much area in sort of like a big angle almost. So the shape we get, uh, the area swept out by the line, looks something like this. It's sort of fat and short. Uh, whereas when it's very far away, Although it's not moving very fast with a high velocity, the line joining the sun and uh, and the planet is very long. So like a sort of small angle is going to give us uh, quite still uh, a bigger area. So these two shapes here, uh, Kepler said, if you give the same amount of time for the planet orbiting the star, these two areas should be the same. And that could be the planet moving from here to here or here to here. If you give if if you have the same period of time for that planet to orbit the area swept out by that line jo uh, joining the planet and the sun should still be the same. So last of all, his third law uh, is that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. Uh, semi-major axis, you're probably going, wait, what, what is that? Uh, it's just sort of kind of like uh, the average radius of the orbit. Uh, but essentially, when you have an ellipse, uh, you're going to have two points on it, which are the furthest away. So, for example, these two points are the furthest away on this ellipse from each other, and that's called our major axis. And if we cut this in half and take half that distance, that's our semi-major axis. So that's sort of like a mean radius of the orbit. The average so is sort of like an average a measure of the average distance from the planet to the sun. So to derive this, uh, that t squared is proportional to r cubed we're going to start off with our formula for centripetal acceleration which is that acceleration is equal to the velocity of the object squared over the radius uh, sort of like the distance between the object, two objects so for example if I was holding a yo-yo above my head and swinging it around on a string uh, then the distance between my hand holding the string and the yo-yo is going to be the radius and the speed it's travelling around is going to be its velocity and if I were to double the radius, so I doubled the length of that string, then the yo-yo would move in twice the distance uh, because it would be moving. Uh, I've forgotten the word for the outside of a circle, and I'm trying to do a physics vision video. How bad is that? Uh, uh, the circumference of the circle. If I double the radius of the circle, I also double the circumference. So I double the distance the yo-yo has to move. And because it's travelling at the same velocity, that means that I double the time it takes, which means that the, the acceleration is causing the same change in velocity, but it's got twice as long to do it. So the magnitude of that acceleration is going to half, which is why the acceleration is equal to v squared over r divided by the radius. If I double the radius, I would have to half acceleration to keep velocity the same. Now, if I were to hold the other two things, con uh, if I were to hold the length of the string constant, but I doubled how fast I was spinning it, so the yo-yo was travelling twice as fast, then the acceleration has to take place in half time because the object's moving the same distance at twice the speed. Uh, so that would cause the acceleration to double, but on top of that, 
uh, the change in velocity also has to double uh, because if it were to move 180 degrees uh, in its sort of orbit uh, its velocity has uh, changed directions completely so because it's at a tangent to the circle so that means if I double the velocity I double the change in velocity uh, over half the time so my acceleration is going to quadruple if I were to triple the length of the string uh, not the length of the string, so if I were to triple the velocity of the yo-yo the, acceler the, the change in uh, velocity would be triple and it would have to take place in a third of the time so the magnitude of the acceleration would be nine times as big hence why it's uh, v squared so next we're going to take Newton's second law uh, which is that the force is f equals ma so the force applied on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the acceleration it experiences due to that force so we're going to stick on m, uh, stick m on both sides of the equation to get ma equals mv squared over r and therefore the centripetal force acting on an object in circular motion is equal to the mass of the object times its velocity squared divided by the radius so in the, I've sort of drawn a little picture here so we've got planet of mass m orbiting uh, a velocity v with a distance r away from the sun and the centripetal force is f uh, just like a sort of wordy way uh, to sort of explain it maybe is that uh, the centripetal force uh, is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity squared and divided by the radius of its orbit so now another way to represent the centripetal force between the two objects is Newton's law of gravitation and he said that the magnitude of the force between two objects uh, of mass big M and little m is gmm over r squared and a big G is just sort of like a sort of conversion factor uh, because as you can imagine the units for force aren't the same it isn't meter squared uh, sorry kilogram squared over meter squared uh, and also it, it, it's just sort of like a fix it factor that you stick in front uh, to convert it to a, uh, a magnitude of a force so that's just it is just a constant like Stefan's constant or uh, finds constant or something like that uh, so what we can do is set these equal to each other so we have mv squared over r is equal to gmm over r squared uh, first of all we want to get rid of velocity in this equation which we know is equal to distance divided by time now we're going to set the distance uh, to be like a full orbit so it would be the circumference of a circle where r is the distance between the sun and the planet so the distance it travels would be 2 pi r, 2 pi times the radius, and the time it takes would be the period, because that is, uh, by definition, the time it takes for a, uh, a full orbit of a planet. So we can say that v is equal to 2 pi r over t, and therefore v squared is equal to 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. Uh, and therefore, the mv squared over r is equal to 4m pi squared r squared over t squared r so our next step, uh, there's, these things are still equal to each other because I've just uh, substituted in something else for v squared. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to times the top and bottom of this by r so that I get 4m pi squared r cubed over t squared r squared. Now I can cancel out the r squared on the bottom of both equations and the small m on the top of both equations. So remember, small m is the mass of the object orbiting, so our planet and big M is the mass of the sun, the thing it's orbiting. So after cancelling these out, we get 4 pi squared r cubed over t squared equals gm. And then what we're going to do is just multiply both sides by the period squared, t squared. And that should give us r cubed in brackets 4 pi squared is equal to t squared in brackets gm. So all um, the things I've put in brackets should stay constant for an orbit. Because 4 pi squared, that's just a number. Big G, again, that's uh, a number which is not going to change, uh, hopefully, unless the laws of physics change. And then Big M is the mass of the thing it's orbiting. It's the mass of the sun, which is not really going to change over any small period of time. So we can then therefore say that R cubed is proportional to T squared. So the semi-major axis, which would be R, like sort of like a, almost like a mean radius, cubed, is proportional to the period squared. 
So that was my video on Kepler's three laws. I hope if you're studying phys uh, physics that you found this useful, just use it with uh, revision, or even if you were struggling with it in class and didn't quite get what was going on, that explaining this in like a bit of depth might have helped a bit more um, with your studies, or even if you're not doing physics at all, that you found this video a bit interesting. If you did find it helpful, uh, please subscribe because I'll be releasing uh, a few more physics videos uh, for the purpose of revision and also one or two on maths and hopefully one on economics as well in the upcoming future before exams start. So thank you very much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!